Hello guys, welcome to ruling-academy.com. In this session today, we will again examine another foundation subject of wealth control, also called wealth integrity if you wish, which is how to construe the true strength test graph and determine whether it is FIT, LOT, or SLOT. We'll also get to the basic of working out Equivalent mud weight of shoe strength or maximum allowable mud weight, another name for it. And more importantly, is to work out maximum allowable annular surface pressure mass, particularly for sub C BOP, which is more tricky than surface BOP. This is a crucial aspect of the Q sheet in the wear control. And as drilling engineers, supervisors, the superintendents. These are of the criticality that one must stay on top. Of course, for other people like drillers, tombusher, OIM, other drilling hands, this is quite beneficial for you if you get hold of it. No harm. Only good. Now let's first kick off with this example of working out the shoe strength of 22 inch casing shoe. Now look at this graph here. This is the classic graph of pore pressure fracture gradient, PPFG graph. This is the familiar aspect of a ruling engineer or a ruling supervisor or a ruling superintendent. If you work in DNC department, this is your normal thing. Now there are a lot of information here. Let's just pay our attention to what is necessary for this session today, which is the pink line here. Let me change the pointer. All right now, the pink line, follow the pink line, this pink line here. I mark here, this is the fracture gradient line. And this green line over here is the pore pressure line. Now, here we examine. The plan is calling for 22 inch casing shoe to be set at 1,337 meter. This is really simple. This is a real well design. Okay. Now look at this graph here. The fracture gradient. This is 13 ppg. So every division here is 0 0.2. 13.2 here, 133 so the estimate of the shoe strength here is third, around 13.3 ppg equivalent mid weight right so remember this the information displayed in this graph is only theory this is what is whatever is extrapolated or interpolated and from the offset where data that the geologists our colleagues give us they work them out. They work these figures out. They are excellent. They are scientists. However, these numbers are subjected to be changed in reality. Right? Reality may give you something surprise. Therefore, this bear in mind figure here is theoretical. Now, this is what happened in real life. This graph is the pressure, the shoe strength pressure recorded by the cement pump recorder computer. The information is given here that the actual 22 inch shoe TVD is set at 1341.5 meters. So it is different from the theory we call for. And the mud weight we use for this strength test is 15.5 ppg. Remember, 15.5 ppg. Now look at, look at this graph here. There are a few important things in this graph. Number one, the red line here. This is the pressure line that we apply into the wear ball. All right. The the silent line here. This is the pump rate. All right. Now look. And this blue line here is a volume, total volume that we have pumped into the wear ball for the shoe strength test. All right, now let's examine what happened in here. First, we draw a linear line. This green line 
along this pressure line here. Now, what we see in this line, this is a linear line. The pressure graph here, the red line, follows the linear line. There is no break in here, no diversion here. So this is the first term, the critical term. But this is a formation integrity test. There is no diversion here at this point. And this point here, what is it here? This is where we stop the pump, right? And this here, point here, is where we bleed off the, the volume. We stop the pump here, right? We stop pumping here, we stop the pump here, and now we let the pressure stabilize, right? And now here we bleed off, the pressure drops down. All right, so at this point where we stop pumping here, we project it to the vertical axis here to find out these figures here, how much pressure here. We will do it later. And now look, here, this gap here, right here, right where I mark right here, the bomb, the pump is not started, but we already have some figures of pressure here. It's nearly one, it's close to one rapid I here. Not sure how much. We'll look closer into it later. So this is a gauge offset. This is important. Why is there a gauge offset here? So the cement unit is lower than the RKB. So from the cement unit to the, the RKB, which is your rig floor, there's a vertical depth in there, vertical height. So that causes the hydrostatic pressure registering on your gauge. You have to take this into your account for calculation later. All right, we'll come to this point later. So now from the field, this figure here is hard to figure out the value of the pressure here, right? So now we take the data recorded from the cement pump recorder in Excel format and we draw this chart. So what do we draw here? We have here, we have the same here, gauge offset here. So now we have a closer look here. Now we see it's about 60 or 65 VSI here, something like that, okay? Now we draw a vertical, a linear line here along the pressure graph. And we see that the pressure graph doesn't break away from this linear line. There is no divergence. So this is again confirmed. This is formation integrity test. No leak off in here. So this is the point where we stopped the pump before, right? Right, so we set here the range of 60 psi. Now we project from this pump stop point here to the vertical axis, which is a pressure axis. So we work out here about 540 psi, all right? So this is the surface imposed pressure that we impose into the wet wall, all right? Now, how are we gonna work out a shoe square test? So the gauge offset before we start from about 60 psi. This is linear line, no deviations, so it's the integrity test. And the pressure at stopping pump is 540 psi. We have to take the differential from here to here, from these two points. Right, which is 408 IPSI. You have to minus the offset. It's like you 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 taking your weight. You get on the scale, and the scale is pointing at five kg. You don't count that five kg into your body weight, right? You have to take it off. Now, how to work out the maximum allowable mud weight in equivalent mud weight? So we use this formula: the mud weight at test plus this delta P here, my, divided by 0 0.052 times TVD of shoe. So mud weight at test is 15.5 plus 48i divided 0 0.5, 0 0.052 times 1341 here, shoe TVD. Change it, convert it to feet, 3.284. Okay, so it is 13.63. Right? We need to round it down. We don't round it up for our safety. So it comes down to 13.6 ppg. So remember, we come back to the first, the first graph. Here, yeah, the first graph, the plan was calling for 13.3. This is the estimate. And now we work out it is 13.6 ppg. That's a lot of difference, right? So as I said, between the theory and the practice there are some differences so this is easy enough 
can screw in the FIT graph. Now we come to the next example, which is a little bit different from that one. Now we come to the next session with you now. Now this plan, this is the same graph. This is the pore pressure, green line here, pore pressure, pink line of the fracture gradient here. 16 inch shoe is planned at 2,580 uh, meter TBD. And the strand here, this is the strand, okay? This red dot, yellow dot here, they are from the offset well. So the geologists estimate the shoe strand here is around 16.5 dBG equivalent metal weight. All right, again, this is the theory, theoretical number. So how we want to work it out in reality. All right, in reality, this is the chart of actual. Shoe depth set at 2,576 meter, and the mud weight we use for the strand test is 12.8 ppg. All right, same as before, the red line is the pressure, the pressure that we impose to do the wear ball. Now look, first we draw a linear line along the pressure graph here. And right here, we have a divergent point. See, the red line is diverging from the green line. So this is the leak off. This is the leak off pressure at the point here. This is not in integrity test anymore. You see, this is the difference. All right. And this is where we stop the pump here. After the leak off point here, we continue applying pressure a bit more, and then we stop the pump. After we stop the pump, we let the pressure stabilize, and then here we bleed off. We project from this leak off point right here, this point here, this leak off point here, to the pressure axis to find out this value. It's hard to figure it out here, right? So we will come to the next chart, next graph to figure it out. And don't forget the pressure gauge offset in here. See, it's about 100 psi offset in this case. This is because of the hydrostatic pressure of the height, different heights between the rig floor against the cement unit. Now, on this, this is the data that we collect from the, compu the cement computer, right? We plot this chart, then we draw the linear line in here, and we see the diversion point right here, right here, diversion point, right? So we project it to the vertical axis, which is the pressure line, we have 1650 PSI, all right? And don't forget, we had we said before that we have about 100 PSI gauge offset here. So we work out how, how we're gonna work it out here. Stop on there, build up there, and now we're gonna work out. We use the same as before. We use the same formula. We take the mud weight at the test, and we take the differential of the offset and the leak up pressure. This is the leak up pressure, leak up point here. Right? We take that differential divided by 0 0.052 times to, to, to vertical depth. Okay, we work it out 16.32 ppg. We round down, we take 16.3 ppg. Right, this is a lot different. This is smaller than what you know, what, what the plan calls for, right? The plan calls for 16.5 ppg. Now we have 16.3 ppg, different. So now you understand the difference between leak off test and, and integrity test. Integrity test, formation doesn't take fluid. Leak off test, the formation start initiating a little fracture to take fluid. Now we come to the, the next one, which is the extended leak off test, or in short, we say S leak off test. And we're not going to go much into this one because this one is particularly for HPHD, but I don't really highly recommend it to perform this extended leak off test unless you do it for a specific research or study purpose for geologists' friends. Now, this is this black line here. This is the pressure line that you apply surface into the wear bore. So we pump into the wear bore. So this point here is the formation integrity test. We come here, the pressure start leaking off into formation. If you draw a linear line here, right? So this is the diversion point here. So we keep pumping, we don't stop until the pressure reaches the peak and then it will fall, we drop down. 
So this peak here is called formation breakdown pressure. After that, the pressure drops down. We keep pumping, don't stop. Keep pumping, and the pressure will stabilize around around some number here. All right, we wait. It takes about five ten minutes here, then we stop the pump. All right, we take this. Maybe you can take the average pressure, or you can take the last reading here. All right. So the first pressure drop upon stopping the pump is called an instantaneous shut in pressure. All right. And then we let the pressure stabilize. The pressure continues to drop. And then we wait for about 10 minutes to see how it stabilizes. Then we bleed off. This is the bleed off point. We bleed off here. This is the pump stop point. So you have a curve. So this is a double tension calculation. You draw from where you stop the pump to the first point, the pressure drops. You draw a tension line, and then you have a curve where pressure stabilizes. Draw another tension line here. So the intersection point here is the fracture closure pressure. This is this fracture closure pressure FCP is the value that you will use to work out the maximum allowable mud weight or equivalent mud weight. All right, you use mud weight at press plus FCP. Divided by 0 0.052 times 2 shoe TVD. All right, but the dangerous thing with the extended decoctor is you already broken down the formation around shoe. So your shoe is weak now. It's a lot weaker than when you perform either FIT or Licofest. So you may suffer losses while drilling with high ECE or high metal weight. So it depends on where, all right? So this is just my recommendation, just my warning for you. Now, what is mass? Is it maximum allowable annular surface pressure? We can see that the shoe is the weakest part of the wear bar. And mass is the limit pressure value. We read it at the case and pressure gauge on the choke line as surface. So once this limit is exceeded, there is a risk of breaking down the shoe here. I don't say that you definitely break it down. I say there is a risk of breaking down the shoe. So whenever you change the mid weight in the wear board, you need to recalculate this mass. And the rule is if you increase your mud weight, your mass is going to be reduced. Now, during killing the wall, when the influx is below the shoe, then we control the choke. We follow the case in pressure, we follow the group by pressure graph, whatever you follow in your curing method. We're not going to discuss it now. But the key is you need to control your case in pressure to be low mass when your, wall, your, when your influx is below the shoe. Right, but when your influx is above the shoe, then you don't care about mass anymore. All right, there is a reason for it. All right, we, when we said that when mass is exceeded, there is a risk of breaking down the shoe. But why, when the influx is above the shoe, we don't care about mass anymore? All right, there is a reason. If you want to know more about this reason, send me an email or, sh or, sh or shoot me a note. I'll get back to you on that one. So the key thing with shortening is you should in quickly to minimize influx volume to assist in keeping case and pressure low. Now, how to work out mass on surface on surface rig? When I say surface BOP or surface rig, I mean land rig. The BOP is on surface land rig, jack up platform tender, marsh rig, whatever. So it is easy, right? Because when we during killing the operation, we circulate through the choke line of kill line. So we must care about what fluid is in the choke line kill line. For surface sites, choke line kill lines are always filled with the same fluid as mud in the hole. And they are right at surface, right? They are not going in, they are not too far from the BOP. So we use this simple formula, these two formulas here to work out. All right. 
what about substrate view of wave? It's a lot more tricky. Now, look, there is we have air gap, we have water depth, sometimes water depth is deep, right? Hundred or thousand of feet, right? And choke line and queue line are long, right? So it is important that we have to know what is in the choke line and the queue line. Because when we do recruiting operation, I say again, we circulate via choke line and queue lines. So we must know what's inside the choke line and queue line. And for sub BOP, do not forget choke line friction loss. Right? When you turn turn the pump on, you take choke line friction loss off. And when you turn the pumps off, you put the choke line friction loss back in your pressure gauge. Alright? So subsea stack, choke line and queue line could be filled up with different fluid and the mud in the hole. So when you come on the reef floor, ask the first question, what's in the choke line and queue lines? Okay? So if choke line and queue lines are filled up with the same mud as in the hole, then that is easy. We use the same formula we asked before. Right? We work out the EMW, maximum allowable mud weight here, by this formula. And then you work a mass using the mud, maximum allowable mud weight minus the mud in the hole times the shoe TVD times 0 0.052. And this is the final static mask. Okay, I said this is final static mass because you will have dynamic mass. Dynamic mass. Now, if choke line and kill lines are filled up with glyco or sea water or salt water, whatever to prevent to prevent to barrel sack, all right, then the fluid density of the fluid in the choke line and kill lines is lighter than the mud weight in the hole. Then you have to work out, the, we call it delta mass. So you take the mud weight in the hole deduct minus the fluid density in the choke line q line times 0 0.052 times the riser length riser length equals air gap plus water depth right so you work and then you work out the final static mass in this case so which is the mass that you use in, in number one here in this formula number one you plus Delta mass. This is your final mass. It will be greater than the original mass in number one formula here. Then you work out the dynamic mass, which is deducted from the final. Uh, you deduct the choke line friction loss from the final static mass to get the dynamic dynamic mass. So dynamic mass is important when you turn the pumps on. You stick with this dynamic mass. When you turn the pumps off, you stick with started mass. All right? See how, how quick it is for subsidy BOP. And thank you very much. And I hope this presentation does give you some useful information, especially for the subsidy BOP and for those who are struggling with interpreting, uh, interpreting the graph of FIT or LOT. And if you have any questions, queries, recommendations, please forward them to my personal email address at litch.tran01 at yahoo.com.sg. And see you soon in the next subject of the well control. Bye-bye.